This is not a lectionary text that we read this morning from Exodus. This is one of the lessons the kids are going to learn this week at Vacation Bible School, Moses in the Burning Bush. But I wanted to preach on that because I always like to preach on something for Bible school that's coming up that the kids are going to learn so you can help reinforce it at home. But today is not just Father's Day. What is today? Juneteenth. What do you all know about Juneteenth? Here we'll just we'll go off script a little bit. What do you all know about Juneteenth? The day what? No, it's not the date of the Emancipation Proclamation. Bill's like, I know, I know, I know. Two and a half years after the end. That's right. Um, go ahead, Mark. They formally announced it in Texas on June 19, 1865, two and a half years after Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and several months after General Lee surrendered to General Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. And um, General Gordon Granger went into the town. It's the first time that the slaves, the enslaved black folks in Africa had ever seen Union soldiers, much less black Union soldiers, and it moved them greatly. And they found out that they were finally free so last year, Joe Biden made it an official federal holiday of the United States of America. So I'm glad some of you get the day off. And if some of you are rolling your eyes, I'm going to ask you to hold off on that because we need to talk about these days. This should not just be a celebration for black Americans. This should be a celebration for all Americans, and especially those of us who are children of God and Jesus Christ. So let's talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now... This passage of the burning bush is so familiar that sometimes you just tend to hear it and let it go by, right? You know what happened. But there are some very key points in this that we need to understand. Moses started out his life floating down the river. Declan was here this morning, little Declan Bardoff at the first service, who made his acting debut in one of our Bible school great videos as Moses floating down the river several years ago. If you don't remember it, we'll show it again one of these days because it's precious to be because Moses' mother was ordered, as all the women of the um, Hebrews were ordered, to throw their baby boys in the river. But nobody ever said you couldn't put him in a little basket, right? Covered with pitch so he could just float along. So she technically did what the law required. Amen. And she, who found Moses floating down the river? The daughter of the Pharaoh. So he was raised in the lap of luxury. He's raised with privilege like none of us have ever dreamed of having before. And then he sees an Egyptian soldier beating a Hebrew slave. And what does he do? He's so outraged. What does he do? He commits murder. He kills him. And then he flees to the land of Midian, where he marries a woman named Zipporah, Zipporah who has a father named Jethro, and he works as his father-in-law's shepherd out in the field, keeping watch over the flocks. Common in the Bible to be a shepherd. But it catches his attention one day, as it would ours too, that there's a shrub, a bush that is burning and burning and burning. And you always, especially in those days when you saw a fire, you were very worried it would spread. So it doesn't seem to spread and it doesn't seem to use up its fuel either. It just continues to burn and he says, I've got to go see this thing. And God speaks to him from the bush and says, Moses, Moses, knows him by name. Moses gives a good answer. Here I am. And then what does he say? Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet. The ground you're standing on is holy. Then he announces, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid. I'd be afraid too if a burning bush was standing there and started talking to me and it was the voice of God, I'd be scared out of my mind. But this is the part that always gets me. I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings and have come down to deliver them. Adam knew Eve. How many of you remember the King James version of Adam knew Eve? Adam knew Eve, and what happened then? She conceived a child. How are yours, Kayla? You're the only kid here this morning. You know what that means, right? Adam knew Eve. It's the same verb. To know means to intimately participate in somebody else's life. So what does that mean when God says, I know their sufferings? God is suffering with the people. 
God does not like slavery in the least at all. Not one little bit. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them. And Moses is thinking, yeah, go, God, go. And then God says, Moses, this is what you're going to do. Because that's how God works, isn't it? God says, I have a job to be done. This is what I intend to do, and you're going to do it for me, people of God, people of faith. And Moses says what? But, 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 but. But Moses said to God, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And then the audacious question of audacious questions, whom shall I say is sending me? God's name is I am. Considered too holy to speak by the Hebrew people. Consider now the Catholics don't use the word Yahweh anymore, which means I am. But there is another translation, a fuller translation. It means I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. That is who God is. We cannot change God. We don't want to change God. God is who God is. God knows the suffering of God's people, and God does not like it when we suffer. God does not like slavery or taskmasters who abuse others. And so God is going to come down, and Moses is going to get a new job. How many of you have ever been called to do something you didn't necessarily want to do? It took me three years to talk myself, trying to talk myself out of entering the ministry. I was called, and I said, surely you're crazy, Lord. God did not relent and continue to call me for three years. I tried to talk myself out of it until I couldn't do it anymore, and I had to say yes to God. Part of it was out of fear. I told my parents I want to be a pastor. My mother said, people are mean to pastors. She didn't know the half of it. But he didn't let the fear stop him, did he? Moses, a lot of people think, had a hearing disability because he could not speak very clearly, so his brother got to speak for him. But Moses was still the one that God called and raised up and sent in to see the Pharaoh. Keep in mind, this is the same Pharaoh who knew who he was because he was the one who killed one of his servants. He sends him back into the line of fire. One of my personal saints has always, always, always been Martin Luther King Jr. He had a similar experience in 1958, which happens to be the year I was born. That's how long ago it was. And he wrote about it in this book, The Stride Toward Freedom, about when he felt that he had been called to do something that was beyond him when the bus boycott in Mobile, Alabama went on longer than they thought. He was getting death threats every day, and he had gotten one the day before, and he was at the end of his ability to go on. This is what he writes. I got out of bed and began to walk the floor. Finally, I went to the kitchen and heated a pot of coffee. I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I cannot face it alone. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I never had experienced him before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of the inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. Three days later, his home was bombed with his 10-week-old baby daughter and his wife inside while he was at a prayer meeting at his church down the street. And we know what happened then. 10 years later, in 1968. But he heard God say, I will be at your side forever. What did God say to Moses? I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. I know I talk about racism a lot because it is one of the greatest evils in our society, something that we are all called to stand against. We have to take a stand. I'm not accusing anybody. I'm inviting you to be part of becoming an anti-racist. An anti-racist isn't somebody who just sits by and says, what can you do? What can you do? What can you do? I don't treat people badly. That is not enough to let us off the hook. Um, probably 10 years, uh, years ago now, my friend, who is now working for the Archdiocese of Baltimore, was serving as the youth director in his local parish. He had something that he was participating in called Justice Action Week. They brought kids from all over the Archdiocese of Baltimore together. They talked about justice issues, social justice. They talked about racism. They talked about 
poverty. They talked about all the things happening in the city of Baltimore. And they went out every day and they did a different project. They visited a different place. He was telling me about how successful the project was. And I said, have you ever considered doing disabilities as a justice issue? He said, what do you mean? Now, remember, I worked in deaf ministry early in my career. And I know a lot about disabilities of different kinds and how that impacts people in our community. Over 70% of women in nursing homes, over 70% are sexually assaulted, usually with another person in the room watching, if not filming it. Old age can be a disability. 85% of women who are hearing impaired have been assaulted because they can't speak out against it. So he said, come down and talk to my kids. They really need to hear this. And I was talking, and I showed a video clip of my least favorite comedian of all time, Larry the Cable Guy. Can't stand Larry the Cable Guy. He is not a rural person at all. That accent of his is put on. His name is Daniel Whitney, and he is the son of a pastor. He's a professing Christian. The video I showed is one of his most famous little shticks sings a song called Donnie the Retard. Donnie the Retard had as an eight pound water head. He said five foot three and he said to me, I love tater tots. I looked up the lyrics to make sure I got them right this morning and it says, make retarded laugh. I don't know if you've seen all the memes that have come up. I love tater tots with little kids with Down syndrome, with people with disabilities being humiliated by a man whose father was a pastor who claims to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I showed it, and this kid laughed out loud, and he went, oh. He came to me later, he said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to laugh, I didn't mean to laugh, I didn't mean to laugh. Well, a year went by, and I was invited back to Speech Justice Action Week again. Same kid came up to me and said, Pastor Terry, I'm so embarrassed about last year, and I said, you gotta let it go, and he said, no, I gotta tell you, he said, I just, I feel so bad about what I did. He said, I'm a terrible person, I'm a terrible person, I can't believe I laughed at that. He said, what I started to do at, sh at school, though, he said, I started a group for kids with disabilities. I'm like, you did what? He said, yeah, I started a group. He said, I went to the principal and said, we have to have something to stand up for these people. And he said, there was this kid that everybody made fun of. I started eating lunch with him every day. He said, I used to be a pretty popular kid. I'm not so popular now, but I don't care anymore. And then he's told me about how he was getting involved with Special Olympics. And I said, and he said, I'm so sorry. And I said, what are you sorry for? It changed your life. It changed your life at that moment. It changed his life. He moved from being somebody who just sort of stood by and laughed to an advocate, and he went from advocate to activist faster than any kid I'd ever seen in my days. Donnie the retard had an eight pound water head. He stood five foot three and he said to me, I love tater tots. He said, I've seen that so many times since I don't laugh at it anymore. And I said, good for you. Some people might be sitting there thinking, well, that was a kid. That was a kid. I'm too old to change. I'm too said in my ways. Then there's the story of John Newton. I've told you this one before. The man who wrote, we just talked last week about the first and most favorite United Methodist congregants hymn. Their favorite is what? Amazing Grace. Number two was Here I Am, Lord. But Amazing Grace is everyone's favorite hymn. John Newton wrote it. John Newton was the captain of a slave ship. He was a British man who lived in the 18th century. His mother died when he was seven years old. His mother who had taken him to church and told him the love of God and Jesus Christ. But his father, when his mother died, never took him to church again. And he became a sailor. Not by choice. They sort of dragged him onto the ship and made him serve. He was so drunk one night, he fell overboard. They had to pull him out of the water. And he worked his way up to be the captain of a slave trading ship. You all know about the Middle Passage, don't you? you don't know. If you don't know, you need to know how horrible life was for people who were enslaved, dragged from their homes. And there was a storm at sea, and he thought, how can I pray to a God that I've turned my back on? And he prayed. And God spoke to him that night, and his life began to change. He still was a slave trader. He still was the captain of that ship. But then it got to the point where he couldn't do it anymore. He could not do it anymore. He had to say in the name of Jesus Christ, it's got to stop. I'm the one who has to stop it. And so he wrote to him, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He went from being the captain of a slave trading ship, which is a fairly lucrative occupation, to being a pastor, which is not a lucrative occupation. 
and he was also active in the movement to abolish the British slave trade. The Prime Minister of Britain at the time appointed the committee to investigate the slave trade, and he was a key witness. He talked about the horrors from the inside out. His compelling testimony helped to make the slave trade and eventually slavery itself illegal. You know who Chuck Colson is? Was. He died a few years back. He was part of the Watergate conspiracy, went to prison. When he was in prison, at his lowest point, he met Jesus Christ, changed his life. He became the founder of the Prison Fellowship Ministries. And the year he died, he visited Maxwell Federal Prison near Montgomery, Alabama, where he had served his time in the 1970s. While he was there, he always preached, and at the end, he'd ask everyone to join a circle and hold hands, and he asked if they would sing Amazing Grace with him. He called that hymn the Prisoner's National Anthem. And every time he went and spoke in a prison, everybody knew the words. We've got to know the words. We've got to live the words, folks. We have got to do everything we can to stand against racism. If you're not an anti-racist, then you run the risk of being an accomplice, a silent person who stands by and watches other people be abused. And we cannot do that anymore. I've told you so many times in sermons, I do not understand how anybody could look at another human being because of the color of his or her skin and think anything less of them. I don't understand it. And if you have a good reason, explain it to me, and I'll tell you why I don't think Jesus is going to like it when you say that to him. i be real blunt with you. One day Jesus is going to ask us what we did with our lives. We better have a good, good answer ready if you, if you have that problem in your life. And I know I sound like a broken record sometimes. We've got to make a change. So why did I pick that second lesson to go with the one this morning? Because this is Jesus Christ standing outside the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Jesus had been asked to come and heal him because people had seen him heal. They'd seen him do things they couldn't understand. They knew he had to be of God. And he waits and he says to his friends, Lazarus is just asleep. And they think, no, Lord, he's dead. Four days, that's the number of days you had to be in a tomb before they really knew you were not going to be revived. And he goes to the tomb and he calls them out. But before that, his sister runs to meet him. This is Mary and Martha, the ones who took him in, the ones who fed him, the ones who comforted him on the road. These were his disciples. These were his closest, dearest friends. They were closer than his family to him at this point. And she says, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. What does he say to her? You believe your brother's going to be raised? And she says, oh, at the end times, he's going to be raised. I know that. He said, I am the resurrection. I am life. I am. Here's your Bible quiz today. What, what does Jesus say I am in John's Gospel? He says a lot of I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am, and I will be. And what did he say to the disciples? We read that last week. We read the Great Commission from Matthew. I will be with you always, always, always. I will be with you always. So my question to you this morning is, do you believe him? Do you believe him? Do you believe Jesus Christ? If he were to stand here in front of you and say, do you believe this? Do you believe I'm the resurrection life? What would you say? Some of you are nodding. What would you say if Jesus said, do you believe I'm the resurrection and I'm the life? Yes? Are you sure? you believe it? And do not tell me the world can't change. If Jesus Christ can call Lazarus from his tomb, who lived his life and died again and was buried, but if he can break the power of sin, if he can break our slavery to the way things used to be, if he can break our slavery to looking down on other people, thinking ourselves better, if he could break the power of white supremacy, which is one of the worst sins that God has ever, ever had to encounter here in our own beloved nation, you know, it's on the rise, right? White supremacy. It goes back to the slave days of looking at people and saying, well, you're not quite human. But you know what happened? They took their slaves to church because they wanted to look like they were here for a reason beyond being enslaved and doing their work for them for free. They wanted to say, we're giving them God, we're giving them Jesus Christ. They wanted them to hear that part in Peter that says, slaves, be obedient to your masters. But instead, they heard Moses. They heard Moses. They heard God saying, 
I have seen my people suffer. I know they're suffering, and I have come down to deliver them. That's what they heard. They heard the truth of God's passion for people of all colors, all kinds, because we are each created in the image of a loving and powerful God. So if we believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection, if we believe he is the life, then we are going to live for him. We're going to say no to the powers of darkness in this world. Folks, there's a lot of crazy going on out there right now. This is the actual anniversary of Juneteenth, June 19th. But several days ago was the anniversary of the church shooting in South Carolina where a man went in and killed people after studying scripture with them for an hour. He shot them to death because he said, I hate black people. We've got to say no in the name of our Savior. We've got to stand up. We're going to do some things this year at the church. We're going to, we're going to do some studies on what it means to be an anti-racist. And again, I'm not accusing you of being a racist. I'm inviting you to take a stand with me against this great evil in the name of our Savior. We are all bound by things. Some people wore chains that were three-dimensional and physical. Some of us wear chains that are in our hearts that keep us bound to the way things used to be. They don't have to be that way. If you believe that Christ is the resurrection, I want you to take a stand with me against these things. We're going to do what we can do to change the world, starting with our own hearts and moving outwards. Just a moment, my friend Kelly's going to come and sing for us. Um, he's going to sing one of my favorite hymns of all time, and I'm going to ask you to stand as he sings. Lift every voice and sing. Just as Charles Colson called the um, Amazing Grace the Prisoner's National Anthem, this is called the Black National Anthem, and it's a hymn of praise to God. You're going to sing the first verse, right? But I want you to hear this, the last verse before he starts to sing. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, thou who hast by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee, lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. We've got to remember who we are in the name of Jesus Christ. And when we get to the point where we remember who we are and who we belong to, we will work together to change the world. My neighbor and my friend Kelly Bell, who's going to sing for you now, and I invite you to stand as he sings.